How does William Shakespeare use symbolism in Much Ado About Nothing? In this lesson, you will learn how the author develops meaning by analyzing the use of symbolism. Let's review. We are performing a close reading of William Shakespeare's play Much Ado About Nothing. Written in 1623, it was designed to be performed by stage actors and is considered a comedy. In this lesson, we will focus our attention on Act 1, Scene 1. Symbolism refers to the practice of using objects to represent ideas. One example of a well-recognized symbol in our culture is the figure of Cupid. In classical mythology, he was the god of desire, erotic love, and attraction. His bow and arrows represent the source of his power. A person shot by Cupid's arrow is filled with uncontrollable desire. Today he symbolizes love, and we run into many different representations of him around Valentine's Day. A symbol stands for itself and a greater idea. It is, in this way, it may be taken both literally and figuratively. Symbols can sometimes have more than one figurative meaning, and we will be exploring an example of one. Symbols used in literature are often used more than once, so our first step will be to recognize that a recurring object may be being used by the author as a symbol. We say that symbols have both literal and figurative meanings, so our second step will be to try to figure out what the symbol means figuratively. And our final step will be to ask ourselves, what ideas does the author communicate by way of the symbol? In this exchange between Don Pedro and Benedict, we notice that the word bull is used three times. Don Pedro says, in time, the savage bull doth bear the yoke. And we see from the footnotes that the word yoke refers to a device for joining draft animals, bulls perhaps together. Benedict's reply refers to a set of bull's horns set in his forehead. What might the significance of a bull or its horns be? We see that the word yoke is also mentioned in an earlier passage, when Benedict is speaking with Claudio about Hero. Benedict seems to be using the term in much the same way Don Pedro did, but I don't think they are referring to the same physical yoke that the necks of draft animals are placed in. What does he mean? We will look at meaning next. When it comes to the bull, there seem to be two very different images being painted. The first is the savage bull a wild beast. We picture a strong male animal capable of defending itself with its horns. Don Pedro says that in time the savage beast doth bear the yoke, indicating that it was a savage beast at some point in its past, but now has been tamed by being placed in a yoke. So an animal that was once wild and free is now harnessed and tame. When we go back to our first passage and examine examine it more closely, we notice that the Benedict jokes that should he ever be found to bear the yoke, Don Pedro may pluck off the bull's horns and set them in his forehead. When we consult the footnotes, we see that the term cuckold refers to a husband whose wife is unfaithful. When we do a bit of research on the term, which we can do by consulting an online encyclopedia or a glossary of terms popular during the 16th century, we learn that a man whose wife committed adultery was ridiculed for being unable to control her. The cuckold, portrayed as a man with horns growing out of his head, was used during Shakespeare's time as a symbol for the powerless man, and the implications of cuckoldry were dreaded more than any other form of social scorn. And for those of us interested in where words come from, we, we will be interested to know that the term cuckold comes from the word, the bird called a cuckoo, which has a habit of laying its eggs in the nest of other birds, essentially abandoning its offspring to be hatched and fed by others. That fact serves to remind us that one possible result of infidelity is pregnancy brought about by someone other than the husband. As a result of this new insight into Shakespeare's word choice, we can add the, the word cuckold to our growing list of images that sport horns. And now when we reread our second passage, we are much better able to understand Benedict when he says, is it come to this? In faith, that not the world one man, but he will wear his cap with suspicion? The footnotes tell us that the cat may be hiding horns, and now we understand them to be the horns of a cuckold. 
Benedict is voicing his concern that there no longer be men who remain bachelors all their lives. He goes on to make fun of Claudio by telling him to go ahead and thrust his neck into a yoke, or in other words, to get married and sigh away Sundays, which seems to be a reference to being bored. Now that we have seen how Shakespeare has used the symbols of the bull and the cuckold to communicate abstract ideas, let's try to articulate what ideas he is communicating. It seems that all our text examples involve Benedict telling us his feelings about marriage. He draws parallels between marriage and having his neck placed in a yoke. He refers to the dreaded cuckold and seems to be saying that marriage means running the risk of having a wife who is unfaithful, a fact that will eventually bring shame to the poor husband. He sarcastically invites Claudio to go ahead and pursue Hero and to sigh away his Sundays. Shakespeare, through the character of Benedict, seems to be making disparaging comments about this long-standing social institution, and we wonder if he has anything positive to say about marriage at all. How does William Shakespeare use symbolism in Much Ado About Nothing? William Shakespeare uses symbolism in Act 1, Scene 1 to draw parallels between concrete objects and abstract ideas by including several references to yoked bulls and cuckolds as a way of inserting commentary about marriage. Must falling in love and getting married always result in loss of power and shame? We examined examples of a recurring image and we asked, could this be a symbol? Then we asked, what does the symbol mean? Finally, we asked, what ideas does the author communicate by way of the symbol? In this lesson, you have learned how the author creates meaning by analyzing the use of symbolism.